Hey guys, this is AC Service Tech, and today what we're looking at is we're doing a little investigation on what it means to have low pressure on the vapor side for R22 and R410A, but at the same time having a high superheat. So what does that mean? So let me just explain. This gauge right here is talking about the evaporator coil. This gauge here is talking about the high side. All right, it's called the high side discharge head pressure. This is actually talking about the outdoor unit. Uh, the condenser coil. This one right here is talking about the evaporator coil once again in cooling mode and it's referred to as a low side vapor or suction. So let's uh, take a look at R22 first and just say you had a vapor pressure of 55 PSIG which is a little low. All right. If you bring that into the saturated temperature of R22 which is a green, light green inner ring that will tell you what the temperature is in the middle of the evaporator coil because this temperature uh, uh, correlates to this pressure as a saturated temperature. You have saturated temperature in the middle of the evaporator coil and the middle of the condenser coil. So if you have 55 PSIG, you bring that in to about 29 degrees in the middle of the evaporator coil. It's below freezing, so there's a problem. As well, if you have high superheat, which means that in the middle of the evaporator cool, you have 29 degrees, but if you read, say, an actual temperature on the large vapor line in cooling mode of, say, 55 degrees, then 55 minus 29 will give you 26 degrees of superheat. So that's how you figure it out. You go within a few inches of where you're hooking this gauge up at on the outdoor unit, and you are checking the temperature on the large vapor line, you take that temperature, which is the actual, minus the saturated, and that gives you the superheat. 55 degrees minus 29 degrees, that gives you 26 degrees of superheat. So that, coupled with the, the fact that you're too low of pressure, can mean one of two things. It wouldn't be low airflow because high superheat indicates that the coil is not having a problem absorbing the temperature from the air. So a high superheat indicates that the refrigerant is not having any problem absorbing temperature from the air. As well, if we were to look at R410A, if we just said that we were looking at maybe 100 PSIG, you bring that in, it's about 31 degrees saturated temperature in the middle of the evaporator coil. And just say that you had measured right on your vapor line, right by your service valve, and you found that you had an actual temperature of 56 degrees. So 56 degrees minus 31 degrees, that leaves you with 25 degrees of superheat. So if that's the case, you know, either way, you're having high superheat coupled with a freezing evaporator coil. That indicates that the refrigerant is not having a problem absorbing the heat from the air, which means that it's not a low airflow problem. It's either going to be low refrigerant charge or there's going to be a liquid line restriction. A liquid line restriction could be maybe a clogged filter dryer, it could be a clogged strainer. The strainer is usually right in front of the thermostatic expansion valve, just like right in here. If you can make that out, it's like a screen. You could have an improperly sized thermostatic expansion valve. Maybe that TXV valve is sized too small. It's actually made for a smaller BTU rating than the outdoor unit and the evaporator coil. Maybe the bulb lost its charge and is not applying any pressure down on the TXV, opening the TXV. Maybe it's just not allowing enough refrigerant through the TXV. Maybe the TXV is bad. It's just not allowing enough refrigerant through. Maybe the bulb is not mounted correctly. Maybe it's not on the vapor line and it's, and it's not near the external equalization port. Maybe the distributed tubes are clogged. In the case of a piston, the pistons don't typically clog up. It's typically the strainer or the filter dryer that clogs up. But anyway, those are some of the liquid line restrictions that you could possibly have. So it's either that or a low refrigerant charge. So to determine that, what we do is we look at the subcooling. So if we take a look at the high side gauge, and say you had about 176 PSIG, you bring that in, and it's about 93 degrees for R22. So if you had an actual temperature on your liquid line by your service valve, which is where you have this gauge connected at, if you have 90 degrees actual, 
temperature on the liquid line, then you take 93 degrees, saturated temperature minus 90, and you have 3 degrees of subcooling. 3 degrees of subcooling is too low, which means that if the subcooling is too low, then you need to add refrigerant, and when you add refrigerant, this pressure will increase, which therefore the saturated temperature will increase, and then the actual temperature will lower, and then you're going to widen the gap, and you're going to have your saturated temperature minus your actual, and you're going to be closer to maybe 8 to 12 degrees of subcooling. So while that's happening here, this side, the actual pressure is going to be increasing. So if it's low on refrigerant because it has low subcooling, you add refrigerant into the low side gauge a little at a time, and what will happen is this pressure will increase and this pressure will increase. But let's just take the, another scenario. Say you had 176 PSIG and you brought that in, it's 93 degrees. And your actual temperature on your liquid line was say 80 degrees or maybe 78 degrees. 93 degrees minus 80 degrees equals 13 degrees of subcooling. And if the rating plate for a system that had a thermostatic expansion valve said that it was looking for say 12 degrees of subcooling, then you have an adequate refrigerant charge because the charge is being stored in the condenser coil while it's running in the form of a subcooled liquid. So if you add refrigerant to the system, in this case, all you're going to do is you're going to increase the subcooling too high, and what will happen is this vapor side will, won't increase, because if you have the proper subcooling, the problem is not necessarily the refrigerant charge. It's some type of a clog in the liquid line or some type of restriction uh, that, that shouldn't be there because of a faulty part or um, debris in the line or something. All right, so in that case, then you would need to go ahead and check your thermostatic expansion valve. Make sure it's sized properly. Make sure the bulb's mounted properly. You can take the bulb off and try to uh, put the bulb in hot water and see if the thermostatic expansion valve opens up, which then the pressure should increase and the superheat should lower. If when you put the bulb, thermostatic expansion bulb, in hot water, so you pay, take this and you put it right in hot water, if when you do that, your pressure doesn't increase or your superheat does not go down, then your thermostatic expansion valve is the problem. All right, so there's some things to think about in reference to that. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AEC Service Tech Channel.